showing the wrong screen, hang on. So hi everyone, thank you very much for coming. Um, we've already done introductions, so I'll skip past the first slide. Um, for those of you that are watching the recording back, I'm Josh and I'm from Avon North Orchard Branch and we've got Amelia who is also helping with presenting this evening, who's Community Volunteering and Events Executive for RLSS UK. So one of the first things to think of is where do you, where do we start? When it comes to recruiting volunteers, it's very easy to think, oh, we need volunteers. And quite often people jump this bit and then go straight to, oh, we need volunteers to help. But identifying what you need them for will help you shape your recruitment process. It will help inform where you recruit them from and kind of how you'd go about doing those recruit that recruiting. So the first thing is to, to sit down and think about what is the need that we have within the club or within our branch or within an activity that needs volunteers for. From that, from that need, you can then start thinking about a role description. Um, it's really important to identify what each volunteer will be doing. Um, it might be that you need six volunteers all doing the same thing. You might need three volunteers all doing something completely different. Um, but volunteers will want to be clear on what they are volunteering to do. And you need to be clear on this too, so that you can get the correct volunteer for each position and so that you can get the best out of each person that you recruit. When it comes to writing a role description, there's different things that you need to think about. So identification of the role. So what's the title of the role? Um, what location is the role going to be in? Is it if, if it's for a life saving club? Is it a poolside volunteer? Is it an admin or a background volunteer where they're going to be based? So thinking about what the purpose of the role is. So this is a bit more of a, a brief general statement about the main objectives of the role include task lists, so what sort of things will they be doing? Would they be responsible for bringing kit to poolside each week? Would they be responsible for planning sessions? Will they um, be responsible for looking after money? Um, list what sort of things they'll be doing. What responsibilities they might have. So what, what, who do they look after? What do they look after? Do they look after people, money, information, relationships? In terms of what skills do they need that do you need someone that's got a particular skill set are you looking for someone that's already a life-saving instructor a rookies instructor are you looking for someone that can be trained up to be a rookies instructor or, or a life-saving instructor so do they need to have a good swimming ability do they just need to be a person that can help at a session with no background in life-saving what relationships will they have as part of the role so will they be working with people Will they be working with kids, adults, vulnerable adults? Will they be responsible for forming community relationships and sourcing opportunities to give presentations at? Or will it just be purely turning up and doing as they're told on the day? What are the physical and social conditions of the role? Are we going to be, are we talking about an evening? Are we talking weekends? Uh, are they going to be on poolside? Are they going to be in the water? Are they going to need to be in the sea? Um, by explaining what the role physical and social conditions could be it will help people identify the role suitable for them always make a statement about expenses um, whether they'll be reimbursed or not so that people know whether they can afford to do the role and what benefits might the role have for them as an individual um, will it help them grow in confidence will it help develop skills will they have qualifications out of it um, lots of people volunteer for lots of different reasons and some of those can be for skill gain and personal development so it's good to be mindful of that when recruiting volunteers. Don't know if I've covered this on the next slide or not, but oops. Yeah, if I have. Um, it doesn't you don't have to make a real formal role description. I'm not we're not always talking about a typed up A4 document of this is the role, here's the formal title. It's you can make it as formal or as informal as you need it to be for the situation that you're recruiting for. But it's good to be mindful of the different factors that have kind of enlisted in what a role description could be formed from, um, because that will help inform later decisions. People are likely to take a role more seriously if it's a more formal description, um, because they know what they're committing to straight up. If it's something where you're only looking for a volunteer for an afternoon or an evening session or just an hour doing an activity or some fundraising, it can be really 
loose and frequent um, and infre informal sorry if you're looking for someone to volunteer regularly over a couple of weeks months or even for a couple of years then the more defined a role description could be the more likely you are to find the right person for the opportunity there's always going to be things that come up and change and change people's circumstances that can't be predicted for but we can make it as easy as possible for people up front to go for a role or not you could also include a list of personal qualities that you would like the volunteer to be able to bring to the role. So you might not be looking for any particular qualifications or experience, but it's what sort of personality traits could they bring that would make it easier for them to learn the skills or work with the groups of people that you expect them to work with. Once you've decided on, the, on all the volunteers you'll need and you've written at least a brief description of each role, you're ready to start finding your volunteers. So I've pulled up a small exercise. Um, so I was going to split people into groups, but I think because there's only a few of us here tonight, I think it'd be fine to kind of do it in a group. But going back to the original slide, I'm going to kind of keep the I'm going to keep the descriptions up in a second. I'll go back a page. I kind of want us as a group to kind of try drafting a role description of what we might want to do. So does anyone have a suggestion of what we could try and recruit for? Is anyone actively looking for a volunteer at the moment? Can we use a live example? Treasurer. You're looking for a treasurer. Perfect. Is that for club or branch? Club. Pardon? Club. So we're looking for a club. So we've identified a role. So we're looking for a club treasurer. Um, what is the purpose of the club treasurer? Uh, to make sure that the fees are coordinated and that uh, expenses are paid. Okay. So it's only pay, pay for the pool uh, and pay the expenses of the coaches. OK, perfect. So I think some of that is a little bit more of the task list. So I, I just kind of say the purpose of the role of the treasurer would be to be responsible for the club's finances and to ensure that the financial tasks are either completed by themselves or delegated out to someone to make sure they happen in a reasonable time. Then we've already started listing some of the tasks, so that could be paying the pool fees, paying back expenses for trainers, um, checking that memberships coming in. I'm assuming there'll be an element of reporting to the other committee members about the financial situation. Yes. Yeah. Any other tasks that a treasurer might be responsible for? Um, sorry, other, other tasks that the treasurer might do. Managing the bank account and subs. Yeah. So responsibilities kind of is similar-ish to a task list, but that's kind of can be a bit more of the broader categories. So that's more what the tasks are things they physically do, whereas responsibilities are more what they they kind of oversee. So being responsible for the finances is different than managing the finances. Arranging right. reports and Pardon, arranging reports to yeah. pass to any committee member, trustee or AGM with the relevant breakdown for each of cost. Yeah, definitely. So for someone to be um, a club treasurer, what skills do you think they'll need? Able to count. Definitely a good one. Yeah. Go on, Jill. <laughs> Sorry, I was chuckling at Reuben in the background of Julie. <laughs> oh, do apologize. Just going for a bath. I was going to say trustworthy in that they have our money. Yeah. Um. Do do you need someone that's got a financial qualification or experience managing finance or are you happy with someone that's willing to learn? I don't think they need a heavy background in finances in that we are a small club. But they need to be able to keep your accounts to be able to give to an auditor each year. Mm -hmm. But I don't think that requires much experience it requires you to keep clear books um yeah. you know income and expenditure yeah but i don't think that requires any formal qualification no 
just requires a certain amount of understanding of how it works. Yeah. So what would the physical and social conditions of the treasurer be? Are they expected to be on poolside every week? Will they ever be in the water? Are, I mean, probably not for a treasurer, but those sorts of ways of thinking. I would say no to all of those. Are you going to be paying cash or is it all banking? In our particular case, everything is paid by standing order. Uh, fees come in by standing order. So they don't physically need to be in club at all. Cool. So we'll look at the physical conditions are basically they can work from home, but welcome to come to club sessions to meet with people um, in person. But the role can be done remotely um, other than meeting with volunteers to get their maybe their receipts for expenses claims. Uh, even um, our receipts we do by email. Perfect. Sounds like a perfect process to me. I, I love a paperless expense process. Um, so expenses, by the sound of it, your club pays expenses. So anything that they spend can be claimed back. And I'm going to go with that's probably under pre-approved by the committee ahead of time. Yes. So what would you say the benefit of the role would be to someone that might give up their time to be a treasurer? In all honesty, a nice, warm, fuzzy feeling and giving back to the community. Um, mm. Yes, they they are learning skills that would look good on a CV. Mm -hmm. um, you're not going to get a qualification out of it. Um, so really, it's it's up to how much you want to put into the role. You could be completely remote and have nothing to do with the club apart from do the books, or you could become more heavily involved. Cool. All right, so we, um, I kind of think that gives us a good example of how to pull one together quite quickly. Like that took us what, about three, four minutes. Um, do we maybe want to, as a group, do we want to do one more example or do we want to move on to the next couple of slides? I think it might be handy to do somebody perhaps who is poolside, a bit more practically involved, as, shall we say? Yeah, so you something on the lines of to get a rookie instructor. OK, so mm -hmm. we've identified a role is we need a rookies instructor. So what would the purpose of that rookies instructor be there for? To in eventually be able to take a group of rookies down the beach along poolside for winter and summer training mm -hmm. to cover the badges of that particular age group of child yeah so um obviously for the purpose of this while we're sketching it out we might be going to people that don't know anything about it what is the boundaries of their age group nine to twelve I mean, I'm not asking for exact, but yeah, I think one of the things we need to be mindful of when writing role descriptions is we know a lot more than the average person do does. And we need to make sure that we put enough information in the role and don't assume that just because we know it, that other people will. I think in life saving, I know from a branch perspective, quite often it's the same people being asked to do additional things so we do need to look more to outside of clubs outside of branches and start recruiting from the general public a little bit more to expand who's helping us rather than the same few people so definitely add detail in um we can always reduce detail down from a role description if we think it's too big but it's better to make sure that we include bits that people might not realize because if I didn't do life saving, I wouldn't know what a rookie lifeguard instructor was. So kind of break down what that actually means to be that. I mean, obviously, if you're in recruiting internally and your club generally know what a rookie lifeguard instructor does, then you can be a lot more simple with it. But if you're going external and there's a high chance that people won't know, then you're going to want to put more information in. True. So next up, we'll look at the task list. So what would you say the tasks the physical tasks that a rookie's instructor would do to be prepared to work in a swimming pool environment 
I'd say that's kind of more the physical and social conditions. So the task would be kind of be what they would what they would be physically doing. So if they had four hours of volunteering a week, what would they be tangibly so doing in those four hours? No, the RLSS. Um, I forgot what they're called. Awards yeah. for the children. And to be able to teach each part of the award. Yeah, has anyone else got any ideas of what other tasks that might include? Preparing equipment for the sessions, getting it onto pool side. Yeah, definitely, that's a big one. And clearing up afterwards. Even bigger. Unless you can get your class to do it. True. <laughs> this is always the preferred <coughs> option. Yeah. I think we're going for a role that's reasonable and realistic to assume. I think that might fall in the realm of fantasy. <laughs> So yeah, so it's things like preparing lesson plans, um, then delivering those plans, um, organising assessments, organising the equipment. Um, I would also say one of the tasks is identifying what equipment what equipment needs the club has. So it might be that they have to talk to the committee and say actually we need this equipment or this equipment needs replacing. So that kind of falls under some of the responsibilities could be for maintaining the safety of the kit, as well as things like safeguarding of the individuals that you're teaching, as well as health and safety responsibilities. So I've kind of jumped in on responsibilities a little bit, but what are the, what skills do you think someone needs to have to be a rookie instructor? Slightly. Sorry, there was two people at once then, what was that? Sorry. Again. Patient. Yeah. A rookie instructor's qualification. Yeah, I think a rookie's instructor qualification will always be on that list of ideal to have. But if you're looking to train someone to post, what skills do you think someone that wouldn't have an instructor qualification? What do you think? What kind of what kind of prerequisites would you think they would need? I mean, I know the award does list some prerequisites, but what sort of things do you think you would advertise? You need to be DBS chair. I think that, come up that is something that will be required of them, but I don't think that's necessarily something that's required of them before they apply. But that's that's definitely something we should be thinking of, and we do cover that in a minute. Um, I think I think need, sorry, I think they need to have experience with children um, and just the different ways that people learn as well. Yeah, so I think definitely that, that's a really good one. I think we're also looking along the lines as well as ability to swim. Um, so we wouldn't be teaching them to swim, but we would teach them how to teach life saving. Um, they must be I willing think, to do the bronze medallion because that's one of the prerequisites of <coughs> instructor. I don't think it's the full prerequisite. I think there is a bolt on if you haven't done the awards before that you're you just need to do a little bit extra in terms of experiencing but yeah if someone has got those, that pre-existing experience of attending life-saving awards that's going to make them a better candidate for the role okay just that's i'm um looking to upgrade to doing rookie instructor now and i've been told that i must do the bronze medallion because that is a prerequisite of the um rookie instructor oh is that changed okay never mind um <laughs> no point we don't need to talk about um so what sort of relationships would the instructor be responsible for? Relationships with the pupils, relationships with the other members of staff, for lack of a better way of phrasing it, and yeah. the committee. Yeah, definitely. I think those are some really good ones. And, um, the, and the facilities that they're in, depending upon how the club is run. Mm -hmm. Definitely. So what do you think the physical and social conditions of the volunteering role would be? Social conditions, they've got to be able to cope with virtually anything poolside or dry side. Yeah, so I think we'd be looking at listing that it would be a, a pool and a classroom volunteering role. Uh, there'll be some requirement for in water retraining um because they would have to get in the water to do their qualification in the first place as well as keep up to date with their different skills um i think yeah that socially they will be working 
probably evenings, probably most likely weekends, because they'll be working outside of the school hours to be able to, to work with the children and young people. Um, expenses, I'm going to skim over just because that's a pretty much the same. It's, yep, yeah, I'm hoping the club is going to cover the expenses. It might be something that you put in that you will cover the cost of the qualification um, as well as any ongoing expenses. Um, you might put some caveats of we'll pay you initially pay the qualification, but they're reimbursed after six months of delivering training or something like that. Um, it's completely up to you how you want to look at doing that. Um, or it might be that you give them a 50% discount on the upfront course cost and then reimburse them the full amount after a couple of weeks of teaching just to make sure that they do. Or What would you say the benefit of being an instructor would be to an individual? It's a way of helping them to gain confidence in just about anything they ever do. Definitely, yeah. Being able to adapt to different situations. Mm -hmm. uh, public speaking is quite a big one that employers look for. Yeah, definitely. No, that's a really good one. I think that's a fantastic list, everyone. Um, I think you've done, yeah, that's, that's really well. I think another only other benefit I could think of maybe for being an instructor is obviously it gives you experience working with children and young people. Um, so that might be something if you've got um, older teenagers in your club, that might be something that could help them get onto a degree course or then get their first job after university or college or whatever it is that they're working towards. It could I think we do have a good balance in our assess of older and younger trainers. And I definitely think that's something that is always a good balance to have. There might also be the benefits of the of, of being able to use the experience for other things, for example, uh, John Moore Awards or D of E. Mm -hmm, definitely. Um, I think another one actually as well, which I didn't uh, think of, was um, I qualified with my qualification and I taught through a club, but actually I was also then employed by Swimming Pool to deliver the course as well through them. So there is also employment opportunities as well at the back of specifically having the qualification. Also helps sometimes for the scouts and guide movements as well. Yeah. That's great everyone. Thank you. Um so looking at you've now identified um kind of a bit of a list of what it is that you're looking for and what sort of person you need. How do you run a recruitment process? So you need to obviously advertise out somewhere which we'll cover in another slide in a minute, specifically where and how. But say you've got the po the post is out there, people are people have seen it. Volunteers can express interest to you. Um, this can be formal or informal. It might be that you ask people to fill out an application form. It might be that someone just needs to respond to an email. It might be that someone signs up via a volunteering sign up link. Um, I use a particular. I use two different bits of software at work that I can send links out and people can sign up to and then I've got people signed up in different formats which is great whether it's shifts or ongoing. There'll be some level of detail that you need to collect from volunteers um, so you're putting your contact email phone number from them as well as um, are they local to you? Having an interview which I've kind of put in um, quote marks because it doesn't have to be a formal sit down interview with three people on the panel with structured questions. Um, it's You can also have an informal interview where you kind of just over a coffee, explain the role, kind of find out a bit about them, about their motivations. If it's someone that you don't know already, kind of ask to see ID to make sure they are who they're saying they are. Um, you might choose to take up references depending on what the role is. Um, as I mentioned earlier, some roles will need a DBS. So I think for life saving stuff, I think that's something that you can probably put on the role description as well, whether the role would require a DBS. John, Again, that role Josh, I'm only going to say this because it's me. Uh, DBS is only relevant in England. Sorry. <laughs> PBG in <laughs> Scotland, and I'm sure it's something else in Ireland. Sorry, it wouldn't be me I, if I didn't comment on it. I should know that because I sit on CDAG. It's just, I'm there for equality and diversity, and the DBS stuff glazes my eyes over. Um, but obviously, if Lee's listening back to this, it's fascinating and I absolutely love it. Um, but yeah, so DBS or equivalents. So it's whether we want to exp 
you want to advertise that up front, whether they'll be expected to go through a check or whether there's any requirement to. I think it is quite good practice and commonplace. But um, Lawrence, do you have a bit of paper to hand? Can you note that down so that we can edit the slides before we send them out to everyone? I will do. Thank you. And um, so once you've gone through that, um, whether you want to have your young people have a say in the process at all. Let's say we are fortunate enough that we've got five people that are applying for one opportunity. Would you like to get them in to meet some of your young people and find out what what sort of say they have on them? I think it's really important to empower young people to have a say in these sorts of processes. Um, schools are increasingly getting part uh, children and young people involved in part of the interviews processing, finding a teacher that suits that class. Um, especially if they have come up through the club, it's giving club members the opportunity to pick who they want to be taught by. By keeping them happy, you're more likely to have them stay in longer rather than choosing someone that you think is the best person on paper, but someone that the club might not like as individuals. Or, so yeah. What else we have is there is a gold standard recruitment process that the RLSS lays out in their safeguarding policy. It's on page 16 and we will circulate the handbook around later for people to have a look at. There's lots of templates for application forms, consent forms, as well as self declarations and disclosure forms. Um, also around how to hire people that might not necessarily have a clear DBS check, but under what circumstances we can still continue to work with them. Um, the DBS checks show up anything and everything that has been marked on their record, uh, depending on the level of check. Um, I'm assuming that will be the same for the checks for Scotland and Northern Ireland. Um, just because one of these checks come back with a mark doesn't necessarily mean that unsuitable for your volunteering opportunity. It's having a look at what and when it was and whether that is a hindrance or not necessarily a hindrance, sorry, um, whether that makes them inappropriate to work with the club. There's lots of things that might that might still allow them to. I know that when I was at university or volunteer service, one of the DBS checks that I was discussing with the manager was a volunteer when they were 18 had got drunk on a night out and had punched someone. At 25, them volunteering in a sober environment to work with children, that didn't make them a danger to those children because it was a one-off circumstance with alcohol involved. So that meant in that circumstance that we were able to risk assess and put that individual still into a volunteering opportunity. So it's it's looking at what comes back and then following the guidance from RLSS. Um, I definitely would talk to the safeguarding team at RLSS if anything like this did come back, but don't just automatically assume that they're going to be a write off. Um, there's a lot them. Um, we'll send the link out. There's lots of other useful bits in there that you might want to have a look at. So I'm going to hand over to Amelia for this section. Thanks, Josh. Um, so obviously, once you've kind of got all your role description together, um, as we've just been through uh, with Josh in that exercise, the next thing is about thinking about, OK, where are we going to advertise this? Where are we going to put it out to attract new audiences and find new people who might be interested in coming along and volunteering? Um, so there's a, quite a few different places where you might be able to advertise something like this. So first off, we've got universities. Uh, students are, you know, thinking about their kind of careers after university and often looking for opportunities that are going to give them um, a chance to develop those different skills, take part in different training opportunities and enhance their CV um, to, you know, gain those experiences that will set them apart from the crowd. So um, that's a great place where you can attract new volunteers from. Uh, often universities will have a um, specific sort of like website where you can advertise your volunteer opportunities to students. Um, you normally just have to email their kind of department or uh, volunteer department or submit a form online to get your opportunity um, advertised on there. Uh, another one is councils for volunteer voluntary services. So these are sort of local community services all across the country um, in different local areas where you can uh, also advertise opportunities, um, usually free of charge if they're voluntary opportunities. Um, and that kind of advertises them to people within that local area. And it's often like kind of one of the first places that people will go if they're looking to get involved locally in their area with some volunteering. So that's a great place to kind of match yourself up with uh, people who are looking for opportunities to get involved with volunteering. Uh, there's also kind of bigger uh, 
like job boards but for voluntary roles so doit.org is a good one for that you can also list jobs on um charity job as and you can put them down as being a voluntary role so that's another great place you can put them and i know in um scotland there's volunteer scotland as well um, which is another free one where you can post your post your listings um also within your branch obviously you can um get in touch with us at headquarters for the branch data and then be able to like send a mailing out um, to advertise the opportunities to people that are already known to you as well because of course they might also be interested in a new volunteering opportunity as well as just as well as like external people who might not um, already be aware of the RLSS UK. Uh, also you can get in touch with like local lifeguards so using contacts through like leisure centres and things like that to highlight the opportunities and again they might be the kind of people who obviously depending on roles but will be looking to develop particular um, skills or training opportunities as well for advancing their careers enhancing their CVs um, and then finally social media so obviously if your um, branch and clubs already have like um pages like on facebook and things like that you can post them up there but also often there's like community groups on facebook and other platforms where you um that are like full of people who might be like looking for um roles and things like that and volunteering opportunities or kind of um groups specific to local areas so that's a good place to be um posting things on there as well if anyone wants any advice and guidance about recruiting university students um, that's literally what I've been doing for the last three years so if anyone ever wants to ask questions feel free to get in touch with me. Uh, do you want to move it to the next slide please? Oh, try and. oh thanks. <laughs> uh, so another kind of exercise now for us to just have a quick think about is what um like what places would you recruit your different volunteers from uh, so for example the kind of role that you want to recruit might require you advertising it in a different place so for example um you might put like a kind of one-off afternoon volunteering opportunity in a different place to where you post something that requires like a bigger longer term commitment and for the person to undertake particular training and things to get involved um, or also thinking about things like what time of year is the event so for example um, for something that's happening in the middle of summer you're probably not going to recruit university students when it's their exam period or when they've all gone home for the holidays um, so I wonder whether anyone has any ideas of like a particular role that you could advertise and where you think might be the best place to put that from some of the options that we just went through you can unmute yourself and say or you can type it in the chat We targeted um, fundraising support at university students um, because it was very flexible within kind of their working day. Um, they could do it from home or wherever, wherever they are at uni. Um, we've got one of the University of London uh, colleges in our village. Um, yeah, but they just don't want to do it. So have you whereabouts have you advertised the the roles like on their university's website like volunteering platform they have volunteering platform to royal holloway and we've advertised on there and but no one's gone forward no we, we're having a massive problem recruiting volunteers which is why i'm here tonight we've we've tried all avenues social media university uh the do it group um We've even reached out to people that have gone through the club and our MPLQ and a part of a lifeguard forum. We've reached out on there to see if any volunteers want to come forward from there. Absolutely nothing. Nobody wants to do it. We're, we're down to now just a handful of volunteers. Uh, well, if it's useful, we can maybe have a chat outside of this and I can have a look at like your sort of descriptions that you've put together and see if I can offer any advice on um, anything that might help improve that and see if we can make it more attractive um, but it sounds yeah, like you're putting it in all the right places so I don't, unless Josh has anything to, be, to add. We might want to be more descriptive we've we've tried to do it general so we can capture anyone uh, we may need to go more specific um, but that kind of then narrows down your pool of pool of people even more. I, I'm a member of several different volunteer organizations and each and every one of them we've got the same problem I think there is there is a sector struggle at the moment for volunteers so I'm 
work very closely with our local third sector organization we don't have a council for voluntary services but we've got an organization called 3sg and we've just had a state of the sector survey and one of the number one issues facing charities at the moment is people signing up to volunteer um people are getting incredibly picky with their time outside now that time is back to being a commodity again they've they've been stuck in home for a long time over a pandemic they've now got the ability to go out and about again people are making the most of it and aren't necessarily looking to volunteer but that doesn't mean people aren't and it's just making sure that we target people in the right way i know from my experience with rlss i've been put off from open like too vague a role with saying that you can do almost anything because it gives you too many opportunities and you don't know where to start I, i'm almost in that in my branch chair role at the moment it's being told i can do anything i'm sat there i don't know where to start if you turn around to me and say josh can you please run one event this month by the end of april we want you to have talked to two schools that's something that i can see as manageable and target that i can do so it's kind of giving people uh, giving them a bit of structure you can advertise multiple different things at once you don't just have to be advertising one volunteer role and you can always say if this is not something that you're interested in we've got loads of other things that you could do have a chat to us or so it's don't necessarily think that you're trying to you'll catch more people by being general quite often by being specific you can get more people because they can see what they can do yeah and we will look into that we did do a specific target against um rookie instructors as well as the general stuff but again got got nothing which is why i'm i'm ending up training to be a rookie instructor which isn't kind of why i joined the club but i want to make sure that the um the club doesn't fold because we're nearly there Fair enough. Right. We've got two more slides, but definitely we can pick this up in the group discussion when we can have everyone face to face and get everyone's kind of opinion on it. And again, like Amelia said, um, definitely meet with her outside and I'm happy to either be involved in that conversation or meet separately as well. So moving on to the last couple of slides. So onboarding is really important. So that's looking at what safe. Um, so kind of treat them like they're starting a new job. What training do they need? Do they need to be safeguarding? safeguarded training, do they need D DBS and all the other possible forms for the different regions? Um, what are their training needs? Um, so are you training them to post for things like life-saving instructor or rookies instructor? Or just for an open position, do you want to explain to them future pathways for training saying, we know that you've come on board in this, but actually in the future there's possibilities for you to go on to do X, Y and Z. Who do they need to meet? Who, uh, what do they need to know? and what resources they need access to. Um, there's no point onboarding a new community instructor to go out and teach CPR if you're not going to give them access to CPR equipment because they're not going to be able to do their role. Um, do they need to be introduced to other club members? Is there any key parents or other figures involved with the organisation? Do they need to be introduced to the local school saying this is now going to be your new contact for your school's workshops? How do you want to let other people know that they've joined you sort of thing and get them started um the better you set them up to start the more they can do and the quicker they can get started doing things so volunteer retention is equally as important um there's no point putting loads of effort into recruiting people if they leave within a couple of weeks couple of months so support your volunteers once you've decided on who you want who are taking on um but to make sure they keep their role and keep their interest up so they don't disappear so keep in contact with all your volunteers that could be monthly newsletter or just regular opportunities so if you so if you're a branch and you've just got a pool of volunteers that do lots of different activities kind of have general communications out to them let them know about upcoming opportunities and changes within the organization organize check-ins so that could be that if you've not heard from a particular volunteer for a while reach out and have a chat even if you have seen them recently just make sure that you still are having those opportunities where they can talk to you about what's going on, any problems they might be having, anything that they want to change. Help them with their personal development. Is there any training in the local community that could help them with their role? Um, again, going back to organisations such as councils and voluntary services, um, my local one runs things like fundraising training all the time. So is that something that your treasurer could do or members of your club could be invited to attend? Um, I know quite a lot of clubs are listed as local uh, registered charities and branches definitely will be under RLSS. So can you look at what free events and training they've got on that could upskill your committee and your members, whether it's things like 
applying for grant funding, whether it's taking on a commission service, if you want to take on professional lifeguarding, there's all sorts of things and training that can come up that could benefit your members, whether it's IT skills and social media. RSS isn't the only people that can help upskill you in ways of running your club and running your branch. Keep it fun. Um, if people are enjoying what they're doing, they're going to keep coming back. If they're not having fun and they're not enjoying themselves, they're going to look for another opportunity. It seems silly, but praise people as much as you can. Even if you've got someone doing your account, like even if you've got the chair, the treasurer, sorry, and they've been doing the accounts for 20 odd years, saying thank you and letting them know that they're appreciated goes a long way. I know I do significantly more when I get praise, not that I do it for the praise, but when I feel appreciated, it kind of inspires me to then go and do something else just because I, I can see the difference that I'm making and it kind of, I get excited and passionate about what I'm doing and it keeps that active and it keeps me going. If someone feels like they're not um, valued or they don't feel like they're making a difference, then they're going to look elsewhere to make a change. Finally, um, the links to some of the local councils for voluntary services in the different areas are listed below. We've got Scotland, Ireland, um, Northern Ireland, Wales and the UK. Um, NCVO is really good because it's got a find a volunteer centre function. So you can go on there and then um, type in where you are and they'll tell you where your nearest local volunteer centre is. Um, it might be worth having a meeting with them if you're struggling for volunteers because it's their role to help recruit volunteers. So they'll be able to they'll know your local demographic, they'll know ins with schools, colleges, groups like that. And things that I didn't realise until a couple of weeks ago is my local um, Canal and River Trust branch have got about 50 volunteers that go around and do water education. So I'm going to try and link up with them to see if there's anything that we can do either to help upskill their members and use RLSS information or whether it's some of their volunteers also want to cost volunteer. So it's kind of see what organisations you can link up with a similar and see where you can share resource and knowledge. And the most important contact on there is Amelia's email address. So she's volunteers at rlss.org.uk. Um, reach out. She's here to help. She's fantastic. She's helped me loads and will definitely be able to help all of you. But in the short term, both of us are sat in front of you as well as Lawrence this evening. And let's take on some of your questions and problems and things like that and see what we can do to give you some practical advice. Andy, yeah, that's a good idea. I didn't think of that. Perfect. Lawrence, do we want to stop recording so that people have got a bit more of an open space to ask and discuss? Um, or do you want to keep recording? And you're on mute as well. <laughs> 